Hey guys, welcome back to another vlog. This vlog is going to be episode three in my Reading Favourite Tropes series. I started this series last year. I did the first two videos around June, July, and it was meant to be a series that was fairly regular on my channel, and I just haven't done another video since, so whoops. Video one in this series was me reading time travel books and the second video was me reading mafia books or books that contain the mafia family trope. The idea of this series came about because I wanted to make recommendation videos for specific tropes that we often see in fantasy and tropes that I really love but when I sat down to like try to write down recommendations I didn't really have many or if I had read a lot of books that contained that trope there weren't always a lot of books I wanted to recommend because I didn't like them so I thought it'd be fun to create a series where I do theme vlogs based on the trope. My plan and thought was also with this series that I would sometimes do videos where I read a lot of books for one trope. Bronte! Well this is fitting I was going to explain a bit more about this video process and series but um, I may as well just tell you what trope I'm doing for this video in particular. It is Animal Companions and I've just got Bronte. Come here, Bronte. I've just got my little grumpy Animal Companion that's decided to show up and she doesn't like to be holed up, but she likes to meow and have a go at me. Anyway, <laughs> I love Animal Companions in fantasy books, um, in real life too, but <laughs> Bronte. I'm trying to film. <laughs> so I've got two books here that I'm going to be reading for this vlog. The first one is The Beast Player. This is actually a bind up of two books in a series, I believe. In total, there's four books, but they've been split up into two bind ups. So this is bind up one. This is translated from Japanese, and I'm so excited for this. There's beast magic. Apparently, it's really fairy tale esque, and there's a lot of Japanese mythology in it. And the next one I have is The Bone Shard Daughter. Apparently there is an animal companion in this. I didn't know that. Um, I was gifted this for Christmas and then I think I was talking about this book with friends recently who have read it and they mentioned there was an animal companion. So I was like, oh my god, this is perfect because I wanted to do an animal companion trope log for this series. And so I'm going to be reading these two books. Well, this is technically two books, but anyway. So those are the books. I hope I find some new favourites. Um, I love Animal Companions, I love Night Eyes from the Farseer trilogy. Robin Hobb books tend to have animal companions or some sort of animated object companions and they're so good and I just love them all. I love magic where it involves the characters being able to talk to the animals and communicate with them and I also just love seeing the animals as their own character and having some sort of influence in the story. So I'm really excited and also look at my jumper, I got this new jumper. And it's got dinosaurs on it and I'm really obsessed and I thought it would be fitting to wear for the intro of this vlog. <laughs> So it has been a while since I filmed the intro for this video and since I started it I have moved as you can see we're in a very different location now but I really want to continue on and I did actually make a start on the Bone Shard Daughter. I got 166 pages through this and I was really really enjoying it. I just got busy and put it down which I plan to pick it up again right after filming this clip. What I can remember from what I read, because it, this has been a little bit of time, is there are multiple POVs. We follow one POV of a daughter of the emperor. She's sort of in training, sort of, to become the next leader. But it's not just a simple training. She's actually also kind of in a competition with a, I don't really remember how, who he is exactly, but he's basically an adopted son of her father's and he's also doing the training along with her and whoever's sort of the better of the two will become the next leader. So we have her POV. Her POV is quite interesting and mysterious because she does have a lot of memory loss. Like she actually doesn't remember her father and her mother and a lot of details about her life. So at the same time as doing this competition and trying to become the next leader, she's trying to figure out her past and like secrets associated with her and her past. The other POV we follow is from this smuggler and he's just escaped this island that has just collapsed 
lap. And that's all I remember from his POV. I'm hoping that once I pick this up, more details will come back to memory and I'll be able to give you a better description. But if I do continue reading this and I'm finding that I'm struggling with the details, I do plan to just go back and start from the very beginning. Okay, so I have continued on with the Bone Shard Daughter and thankfully, once I picked this up, I was able to just like basically pick up from where I left off and it wasn't a struggle memory wise to like get back into the story or whatever so so happy about that because I'm able to retain things <laughs> I don't know anyway I have kind of mixed feelings on this one so far like I am really intrigued and there are elements that I'm lacking but I think the multiple POVs are throwing me off. I used to love multiple POVs and occasionally I still do, but I feel like this year, I don't know if it's because this year I've read a lot less, so I'm a lot used to multiple POVs, who knows? Or maybe I'm just growing out of it. I don't think I'm the biggest fan here. Lin is definitely our main character, the Emperor's daughter, and we're learning a lot about the magic through her POV. It's quite interesting. It's to do with bones. I don't fully understand it yet, but she definitely seems to be the one who's the main focus and has a lot going on. And then next I would say is Jovis the Smuggler. And then there are other POVs and I'm just like, not really sure they're that relevant. <laughs> At least so far. It's not that I don't like the characters. It's just like the relevancy in the story. I'm not getting so far, but maybe it's you know, too early days. Who knows? Actually, one thing I would say is I should say like the main part of this book seems to be like there's a corrupt empire and we're seeing all these different POVs of different people and how the corrupt empire has like impacted them. That's the only real relevancy I can take from some of these other POVs so far. So hopefully there's just more, like hopefully I just want more. I just want to give me more, you know? <laughs> so I had managed to finish The Bone Shard Daughter. I did enjoy this. I gave it like a 3.25 in the end. So I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in depth because I don't think I've said too much so far. I'm going to start talking about the character of Jovis. So there are multiple POVs in the story and one of the characters we follow is Jovis who I think is like late 20s, maybe early 30s. And he is a smuggler. He goes around sort of smuggling children because in this world, these children are given up to what's called the teething when they're a certain age. And it basically means they get a bone removed from the back of their ear. And that bone is given to the emperor to use because the way the magic works in this world is with bones. So Jovis basically goes around, smuggles children, out because this taking of the bones does have a bit of a fatality rate uh, 1 in 25 tend to die one of whom was Jovis's brother when he was a kid he does this for money so he, the parents will give him money and he does it so he's a little bit of an interesting character because he's one of those I'm not a good guy you know I've got an agenda here I'm doing this for my own reasons but really he does help others and he does put in effort um, but he definitely does ask for things in return. He is on a mission to try and track down his missing wife who was stolen from him or who was taken years and years ago and the smuggling job sort of helps him travel around because the way this world is set out is it, there's a lot of islands. At the start with Jovis he is on this island and doing what he does and this island starts sinking and when he's escaping this island that is when we meet our animal companion character who I have not bothered to mention yet even though I am doing a video about animal companions. <laughs> so this is where we and Jovis meet Methy who in my mind looks like an otter cat maybe more of an otter thing and Methy is in the water as this island is sinking and Jovis is on a boat escaping, he picks Methy up and Methy is a baby at first and we sort of watch Methy grow quite quickly. I'm not gonna lie, I liked Methy at first, like they were cute, but then there was this one point where, I'm not gonna lie, Methy creeped me the fuck out. <laughs> he just grew so quickly and then he also was quite intelligent and could talk and I was just like, is this little creature going to eat Jovis at some point? because those were the vibes I was getting. Um, anyway, that obviously didn't happen. I've just been watching way too many like horror movies and stuff recently, so that's where my mind was at. Methy is also obviously, like I said, he can talk. 
There's obviously more the, to him than meets the eye. He's not your average normal creature. He is magical and some of his magic does rub off onto Jovis and we sort of learn, well, we don't really learn much about that but we definitely see that more later on in the book. It, I don't think Mephi was my favourite animal companion. I don't know. I think maybe I found the bond between them and Jovis a little bit stilted and I think when it comes to my animal companions, I really need to see that bond to be really invested in the animal companion and who they're companioned off with sort of thing. We also follow Lin, who I think I've mentioned quite a few times, the Emperor's daughter who's trying to become the Empress herself. I wasn't really interested in Lin's POV at first. I think because the whole memory loss thing, we're introduced to her and she's like got a lot of her memory um, lost because of a sickness she had a few years ago and she's trying to also recover that. I just don't like the like memory loss sort of trope. It just doesn't interest me. So I think that's why at first I was kind of hesitant um, with her character and her storyline. But what I did really love about her storyline and what ended up making me love her storyline probably the most by the end of the book is the magic. Her storyline is where we really see the magic because obviously she's training with her father um, and learning his sort of art with the bones. There was a very interesting reveal at one point as well which I think was the point where I was hooked especially with her storyline and I'm very interested to see which her storyline continues on in the future. I still don't think the other POVs were super relevant. We also follow Fallu who is the governor's daughter and then we also follow Fallu's girlfriend at one point who is a peasant girl and she works for the revolutionary sort of group or the rebel group. We have both of their POVs. I really don't think either of them were necessary or if we had to have them we'll have like one. I think the issue I had with Fellow and I can't even remember the girlfriend's name now but the issue I had with those two POVs was they felt like they didn't serve their own storyline. I got the sense that they were serving the other characters storylines more than their own and I think that's where it bothered me so like there was definitely like things of this i really enjoyed like i really liked the magic the setting of the world i loved it's like all these islands there's a map i'm pretty sure let me show you the map yeah so it's like made up of all these islands so we get like a lot of jovis traveling around and i think that's also why i really like jovis's character at first because i'm always i'm much more interested in the characters who are traveling around and seeing the different parts of the world like that's just like really adventurous to me and i really love and appreciate that i definitely plan to read book two there was just some areas where I just felt like the mark was missed. I think this is a debut, so I think this did just feel a little bit like a debut for me. Um, but I'm really interested to see, especially some storylines where they're going to develop and also the magic, because I think there are some very interesting reveals about the magic in this, and I think there's going to be even more, well, I hope there's going to be even more in future books. So yeah, finally got that one done. <laughs> Of course, the beast player. I've made a start on this. I am currently 128 pages into this. I read this while I did some reading sprints the other day with my friend Ishi. I really am enjoying this so far. We start off and we're following this girl, Ilan. Ilan? Ilan. I'm going to say Ilan. That could be incorrect. I'm going to read a little bit more and then I think I'm going to give you my first thoughts and updates on this book when I get to about page 200 and then we'll go from there. So I've been editing away and I thought I'll take a break and give you my 200 page update on the Beast Player because I'm just over 200 pages in. I think something I really enjoy about this so far but I think might throw other people off is how slow it is. It's a very slow story and the first 200 pages that I've read have really set up for a backstory um, where you introduced to this young girl called Ellen who grew up in this sort of outskirt village and she lived with her single mother. What's really quite interesting and seems to be quite a significant part of the story and Ellen's story as well is Ellen's mother is actually not part of the village people as in she wasn't born in that village and wasn't raised amongst those people. She was actually raised amongst a whole different set of people who are very outcasted and her mother takes care of the Toda. She is the Toda Doctor. The Toda are these serpent creatures and they are used 
for like army purposes like army people army people <laughs> the guards soldiers they ride the toter into battle and such i thought the toter at first was going to be like the mythical creature we focus on all the mythical creatures but no they're not erin is separated from her mother and i'm not going to get into too much of what happens next but there's a lot of moving around which i quite like i'm getting the sense it's going to be a lot more to her mother's people and it's going to become like a significant part of the story because there's just been so much backstory to that given yeah so it's just like really these first 200 pages this has been like evidence backstory where i'm at now i think we're just meeting our mythical creatures or not mythical creatures but our animal companion um it's at a school setting now i did not know this book had a school setting so i'm quite enjoying it i love my school settings and yes we have just made who i believe is going to be ellen's animal companion and i'm already obsessed with their dynamic it's quite um one of those ones where they're so unsure of each other at first and there's a real slow build of trust and that will eventually lead to a bond which is what i'm seeing happening right now and i love that and this kind of made me realized why jovis and methy from the bone shard daughter their animal companion why they didn't work for me and i think it's because i really appreciate a build i really appreciate not an easy start i really love seeing that hesitancy at first and then having to get to know one another and build that trust and that bond whereas with jovis and methy that happened very quickly there was no build we immediately knew methy was like not gonna harm jovis i mean i did have a hot second where i did think <laughs> methy had you know evil intentions to eat jovis but i think that was just my interpretation not how it was supposed to be interpreted the thing is with all these animal companions are always mysterious because they're these magical animal companions that can talk or um have some sort of magical ability but there's also in combination of that sort of that danger because of that unknown that these creatures hold and with jovis and methy particularly like methy there was none of that they were just like immediately got along and because of the lack of the build there was just a lack of investment for me personally so i really like how this one's being done i have to say this book is giving me a lot of fairy tale vibes and also studio gilby vibes like anime vibes like i think the pacing actually is something that might throw people off i think some people might not like it it's a very slow pace and i don't feel like it's picking it up and i feel like usually once you've started a book, especially a fantasy book, it's at this point in the story where things, things as in the pace, pick up. And I don't think that's going to happen. But yeah, so far, so good. Okay, excuse the boring ass background. I just realized I keep filming this vlog in the same area. And I thought I should change it up, but I'm still setting up my apartment. So there's not a lot of options at the moment for like interesting backgrounds. So this is what we're working with. But... I finished The Beast Player and I really, really loved this. I gave it four stars in the end. I was so emotional by the end of this book. This book was just such a journey, especially since it's one of those books where when you're first introduced to the main character, they are 11 years old, no, 10 years old. And by the end of the story, she's like 20, 21 or something or in her early 20s at least so you really followed her through so many years and because the book was quite slow paced the entire time there was a lot of time given to the different times of her life so like we saw her at the start of like a small village then we moved along to somewhere else then we saw her at a school i just loved it and we saw her like in adulthood what she was doing like as a young adult and i loved that like it was a real real journey and i always appreciate that and i think that definitely gave this book very fairy tale vibes um or folklore sort of vibes maybe more fairy tale i don't know <laughs> i think one of my favorite things about this book was a lot of the themes there was a lot of themes of like abandonment and themes of giving up your freedom in order to serve someone else whether that's sort of a monarchy or service to like animals or someone else and how that 
results in your lack of freedom and there's a lot of parallels between the main character Ellen and also other significant characters of the story having similar sort of uh, setups and circumstances of that sort of abandonment and giving up freedom for service paralleling with the beasts of this world because there's something that was really sad but also like so um sort of true to what happens to the animals in our world the animals in here the ones who are in captivity aren't able to thrive they're sort of lacking in health in some ways in comparison to the ones in the wild who are really able to be free and to have full health and full life something else i really loved and enjoyed about this book was definitely the relationships ellen forms she wasn't someone who was super outgoing she's quite a quiet and curious girl so whenever the relationships formed or she formed relationships it was always a slow forming of a relationship and it was also just so meaningful because of that slow build and also because she wasn't super outgoing it just made the book as a whole like a real quiet sort of gentle subtle tone and i really really enjoy it and i think that just lended and blended in so nicely with the fairy tale vibes but oh this is actually like such kind of a sad book i don't really want to get into too much about the actual animal companion in here i know like i did this whole video on animal companions so you would probably expect me to say a lot more but um ellen's animal companion we don't meet until a good chunk of the way through this book and i loved the way it was done i loved the way the relationship was formed and i really loved how we got to see their bond throughout quite a few years and what they meant to each other there was a lot of hesitancy um at certain times and a lot of like them not being able to understand one another which i just really really appreciated but i don't want to say too much because i want to let like you to discover how the circumstances of these two finding each other and getting that bond together like for you to learn it by yourself i really really enjoyed this like i think i said this part was quite slow and it definitely took me a little bit of time to get invested but once i was invested even though the book remained quite slow throughout the entire time i was invested by then so i just couldn't stop reading but yeah four stars i really really loved this i'm so glad i finally got around to reading this now i was only going to read this book and the brain shard daughter but i actually picked up an audio book <laughs> picked up is Fuzzy Nation by John Scolzi. I'm listening it at 1.6 speed and I've only got like three hours left so I'm thinking I might finish this today. This is a sci-fi book so far I'm finding it quite easy to listen to. There doesn't seem to be so far too much heavy description or language that makes it difficult to follow thankfully. Basically we're following this guy Jack who works for this company who goes to planets and they kind of export and mine the planet and sort of take resources from the planet for their own gains and to make a profit and Jack is definitely someone who has his own agenda like he's trying to like take certain things from the planet for himself to make himself more money and all this so there's a little bit of conflict between him and the company in those terms. I did think when I first started this from the first chapter that the animal companion in this story was going to be him and his dog. He was literally teaching his dog how to make things explode using bombs <laughs> anyway <laughs> interesting introduction that one um but no the animal companions it seems like in here are these little creatures called fuzzy or jacks called them fuzzies and they basically look like cats who can walk on their legs and they seem to have some level of intelligence not quite sure how intelligent they are so far but yeah, that's what's happening. And so now it's like Jack's trying to figure out what these creatures are. He's got someone else in. He's living in like this caravan on this planet that his company's like getting resources from. And he like technically needs to like report these creatures. That's sort of like the intrigue and the plot. There's not a lot going on. So I kind of really like it as an audio book because it's easy to follow. Um, one thing I will say is I'm not the biggest fan of this Jack character. He's very like dude bros and his humour and tone really reminds me of Chris Pratt's character from Guardians to the Galaxy. So 
that's a little irritating. <laughs> Those sort of characters, especially guy characters like that, are not my favourite. But I mean, I think I'm just going to finish this because it's quite short and it's what I'm in the mood to listen to at the moment. Anyway, I'm going to try and finish this today, I think, and then I can finish this vlog because I definitely want to get this vlog up in the next couple of days. <laughs> so we've got a timeline here. <laughs> Okay, so I finished my final book for this vlog, Fuzzy Nation, and I've decided my rating is going to be 2.5 stars, which means it was an average read for me. Even though I say it's an average read for me, I actually did find the experience fairly enjoyable. Like, I thought it was quite an interesting topic and it was quite different to the books I usually read in terms of like the themes and discussions and all that that was included. Basically, the gist of this novel is once these fuzzies are sort of found, there's these questions brought forward about whether these fuzzies are animals or whether they're sapiens. And if they are some sort of Ella sapien species, which like essentially like humans, like they've got the level of intelligence of humans, that means that it would jeopardize the company that Jack works for and what they're doing with exporting all the resources from the planet, uh, the Fuzzies planet, uh, is illegal and they won't be able to do that. And so they're going to lose billions and billions of dollars. So instead of this novel being really sci-fi heavy which is what i was expecting from it it actually ended up being like a lot of courtroom drama and intrigue which was so surprising and out of left field but i'm not gonna lie i kind of enjoyed it somewhat i thought it was really really interesting like you had this kind of almost political side to the story because of the way you had this huge company they wanted to you know make money get their agenda and whatever and then you had the rights of these animals and like the ethics behind it as well so it was actually quite interesting i will say the main character jack continued to irritate me like pretty much throughout the entire book he was just such a dude bro and he was one of those guys who tried to put women in their place but in a way that's framed that he's still like a good guy and still like looking out for them he just knows better than them which was just very very irritating i don't like those guys so i don't think i liked the story as much as i could have because of his character and also just the tone his character made the entire story and i think even though there was a lot of interesting elements and points being made in the story there was never enough not just the themes but also like plot in character there was never like enough depth to any of them that it made me like absolutely hook i really appreciate a lot of depth to my stories and it was not there but i think that kind of is why this was such an easy book to listen to and get through quite quickly because there wasn't a whole lot of depth to it overall like i actually had a really like enjoyable experience for the most part i mean apart from the times i got irritated <laughs> It's definitely like not a memorable story in terms of its characters, but more of the particular topic, the main topic with the sapiens and like their right of life and ownership of homeland. That's definitely was very interesting and I would have really appreciated that been explored more. However, I did find out when I went to go like put this on Goodreads that this is, well, I don't know if it is actually book seven in a series, but it was listed as book seven in a series. So I was like, oh my God, have I accidentally read like book seven in a series without reading the first six books? But I went and checked and this is actually a reimagining of another series of books that were published in the 50s, I believe it was, 50s or 60s, a while ago. <laughs> yeah, John Scholes, who I think was a fan of those books and he's like reimagined them or done a spin-off of them with this book. I'm not entirely sure because I haven't read the original series. But yeah, I was very surprised by the lack of sci-fi in this. Um, and I think that's kind of all I have to say on it, to be honest. And yeah, with that, I can now conclude this vlog, which is very exciting because I've been meaning to this vlog for so long i can finally cross it off my to-do list i really hope you enjoyed watching this and let me know if you have any book recommendations 
or favorite books that have like really great animal companions i'm definitely going to still be on the lookout to find more anyway thank you so much for watching i really hope you're enjoying whatever you're currently reading and i hope to see you next time bye